Hi, I'm Drew Hutchison. You're tuned to Local Bias. We come to you from the studios of Greenfield Community Television at 393 Main Street in Greenfield. This is the summer of 2021, and it seems like only 10 years ago I was talking to this guest of mine, Carl Meyer. Carl, welcome to the show. Drew? Has it been, how long has it been since you've been coming it's on? It's been talking close about... to a decade, and I wish we were talking about different things, but we're, 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 on, we're on the same subject we were on a decade ago, so. The Connecticut yeah. River. The yeah. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and it's uh, the renewal process for the Northfield Mountain Pump Storage Facility, uh, the Cabot Station in Turner's Falls. Um, there we go. La plus au change, they, my friend. They, this is it, you know, Drew, and uh, you know, I'm here as, uh, you know, sort of a, a journalist. And, so, uh, you, and you're with the Society of Environmental Journalists. Yeah. So, And yeah, you've yeah. been covering this story for about 25 years, so. That's as long as I've been writing about the Connecticut River, believe it or not. Yeah, I, um, you know, I'll take a little quick bow here yeah. and say I wrote about the Connecticut River Atlantic salmon restoration failure for five years until it finally fell off the table. And that you know, was largely credited to my work uh, because a you lot of things... You didn't about the salmon? A lot of things remain hidden. Well, salmon, when, when, you, when you work for 45 years and you have 20 salmon coming back it's up not, the river... Right. Uh, the scary thing is there are still, there's still, the state of Connecticut is still farming salmon. You know, it's sort of an anti-science position in something called the Connecticut River Atlantic Salmon Commission. So, so, God. There seems to be a lot of anti-science going on, though. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember writing, my, my favorite piece on salmon was about 12, 13 years ago. And, and you, could, you could look this up online. It was called How to Keep a Dead Fish Alive. It was all about salmon. It was sort of a breakthrough piece in some ways. I'd been writing for a while, and they're still farming. The Connecticut River Atlantic Salmon Commission, Connecticut contingent, is still farming salmon. The last salmon was seen on the Connecticut River, do you remember when, by any chance? I have no idea. 1809, the last natural salmon run. Then we set up this massive hatchery system, and we find ourselves today on the Connecticut River in the throes of First Light Power LLC, First Light Power Resources, who uh, came here six years ago now, I think. They just descended. Are they a French? No, they're Canadian. They're, what See, are they? we've been, who it's are been, they? It's been a little while, Drew. They are public sector pension investments. They are a venture capital firm. They are a huge, huge So they're just a financial interest that's looking to exactly. somehow extract a little more profit for their shareholders. And they saw a river where the environmental regulations weren't being enforced. They saw a river without an actual watchdog, an organization right. that, that had lawyers and says, we, we go to court, we, we investigate, and we prosecute. So this is easy pickings. And this was easy pickings, and, and there was this Connecticut River Atlantic Salmon Commission, which basically almost 50 years ago, 1969, made started making the mistakes of turning a river restoration that should have been about American shad and blueback herring and, sturgeon. and eel and sturgeon. And they decided to go after this fantasy fish. And that caused this whole series of events that ended in um, the three ladder Turner's Falls Canal system that pushed every migratory fish out of the riverbed for our three miles of the Into most, the Sushi Canal? The, I, I, I drew, this is your, your you know, yep. The, the, the brut brutality of that canal. And it essentially ruined a river restoration that could have been fixed at the Turner's Falls Dam in 1980 when they, when they, when they could have said, hey, Holyoke Fish Lift has been working for, oh, uh, you know, 20, since 1955. And it's been, proven that it works. And it, it does. And instead, they went after this, this ghost fish. And so here we are. We had a failed system in 1980. And the only people that, you know, I consider watchdogs on this river, and this is, I, we're going to have a couple of episodes of this, Drew, I think. But, you know, Sam Lovejoy. Right. 1974. Mm -hmm. That's a watchdog. Right. This, this, this young man stood up to the power company at the time was Northeast Utilities, Mark Romico, right? right. And, uh, and, and Northeast Utilities still with us, by the way, doing business as Eversource. Right. You know the source to see the Connecticut River Watershed Council now doing business at Connecticut River Conservancy. 
that relationship with the power company, that embedded relationship with power company money, you know, through their board and directorships and stuff, continues until at least last year. So there was another, another way in. So Sam Lovejoy actually stood up and he stopped two nuclear plants from being built in the Montague Plains. Right. And that is what watchdogging really is, right? So we haven't had, we have kind of a, this, this watershed model that's more like a big friends group. You know? So one of the things that you, you just said earlier, though, was that poorly regulated. So there are, or the regulations aren't being enforced. So exactly. there are regulations, yeah. and they can be shown to not be enforced? Um, you can go to my blog, carlmeyerwriting.com slash blog. Well, it's a rhetorical question. It's pretty easy. <laughs> so, Carl, if it can be shown that there are regulations, environmental regulations, that are not being enforced, if that can be shown, then can't there be action taken upon that? Well, you would have to force either the state or federal agencies to do that. You'd have to put the pressure on them to take action. Have you talked to Jim McGovern? And or? That, well, actually, I actually have talked to Jim McGovern a little bit, but as, as a journalist, I don't really get to sort of do the political well, well, no, end You're of not this. supposed to be the advocate. Sort of, but, still, but I do advocacy but journalism. Um, but it, it's more than that. It, it's really people that need to show up. You know, that's, you know, Sam so, Lovejoy So, so did your that name piece. is no longer, it's not just, it can't be just Carl Meyer making a call. No, I don't. I don't do that. Um, but the, but there was a situation. There is a situation been ongoing for two years now, where um, in a place called the Rock Dam. You've been yes. to the Rock yeah, Dam. Yeah, you showed me. Okay. It's beautiful. Um, it is. It is the bona fide and only documented place where the only federally endangered species, the migratory nose. fish, the right. short-nosed sturgeon, can reproduce on this river. It's its spawning site. It's its nursery site. And it spawns and, during a particular time of the year, so actually it shouldn't be that difficult to say, hey, we know that this endangered species has its spawning time at this time. Why don't we have the environment for them be, be, be good for that? I, I'm, you're, you're taking my breath away here. And, and we've <laughs> known this for 15 years, so, right? So we have why, known this. Okay, so they, and in fact, part of the regulations originally is they were supposed to regulate the flow so that it didn't impact the ecosystem, right? Exactly. But now, right, first light, um, first light power resources, which you should always call them Canadian-owned, public sector pension investments, okay? They're, they're, they're part of the Treasury Board of Canada, they came here six years ago, five years ago. They bought it from a French company. And, <laughs> yeah, GDF Suez. And they turned around and slapped the Commonwealth and this region in the face by re-registering their, <laughs> their, their investments here with the state of Delaware. Well, of course they Tax that's... shelter. Yes, that's Tax right. shelter. Okay, so now we are, we are now four seasons beyond when their license expired. And they're April, still operating. April 30th, 2018. We have not seen any... Any more Can water? Can an injunction be filed that they need to Any stop? Any more water in the river, Drew? And year after year, those short-nosed sturgeon are interfered with, and their spawning is basically ruined. The, the cobbles are baking, and if you go down to the rock dam right now, you just do a little examination, and the riverbanks, the actual Connecticut riverbanks, are dissolving. Just a 200 feet away from their power canal, which is really interesting, but that is a DEP injunction kind of situation. That is a National Marine Fisheries endangering or taking of habitat for, for a federally endangered species. Yes, you could, so, but you would have to have an organization that sees themselves and is empowered by their mission to prosecute to enforce and investigate, and I have... Uh, Are there you know, any environmental law firms that pick up stuff like this, pro bono? Do I, I wish I could tell you, I could tell you there's some, there's some white hat that's gonna, here. Could, <laughs> that, that some white hat is gonna come in. Maybe we're the white hat, <laughs> they, maybe the people you know, are the white hat. It's, it's, it's pretty funny because the, um, this is all sort of, it's all encouraged by the fact that there was nobody here. They see, they see federal agencies that have just ignored this river for 50 years, never admitted to their mistake at doing a 45-year salmon program, because if they had admitted it in 1992, when a very smart woman, another hero of mine on the river named Catherine Carlson, did a UMass archaeological um, doctorate 
about the fact that there were so few salmon on the Connecticut River and they had been here for just this few hundred years because of a, a, a cold water That's jeer right. in, the, in the Atlantic called the Little Ice Age and that the year was already, climate was already changing, right. believe it or not, and the year was moving back out. And those few salmon that made a run when the, when the first colonists were here and stuff, they were going to just slowly be ushered off the, off, the, off the stage anyway. But then we were building dams at the same time. So they, so they, they were gone. But, but they were here at the very edge. The right. southern this was most, about their long-term environmental... The southernmost um, edge. This is not where you undertake a program to restore salmon, a federal program right. that cost hundreds of millions of dollars and dumped all these hatchery fish in, which is really, it just skews the ecology of any, any river system. It left our three miles of the Connecticut River here in Franklin County. There, there, is, there is no more dead place in this ecosystem than in Franklin County, and that starves the people in Vermont, New Hampshire, and northern Massachusetts of their river, but that, that is what they did. And if they had been able to sort of say, you know, we only have after um, uh, how many years, 69 to 92, you know, that's you know, 23 years or something like that, we're not getting anything here, but they kind of slapped her back. Oh, this woman doesn't know what she's talking mm -hmm. about. Because people and, cared about the salmon. Oh my God, you know, it was sort of like, and we do all this salmon, salmon stuff every year. And Catherine Carlson was right, basically. You, you know, Dr. Boyd Kennard did yes. all the surgeon work. He was on her committee. Right. It was a fine paper, and it proved out. But it took so long to prove out, Drew, that we just wasted all this time when we could have been doing the science that made us ready to change things on the river. We could, we could, have, we could have been pressing them when the sturgeon came up. We could have been pressing the, the power company when all of a sudden, in the, in the first decade of this century, there was like less than 1% some years of, of, right. uh, of American shad being able to, to move upstream at Turner's Falls through the miseries of the canal. I mean, the, I've heard that you used to be able to practically walk across the Connecticut on the backs of the shad when they were running. That's a much touted thing. And, uh, you know, I, at certain points, um, I'm sure that it seemed true. Right. I mean, and you it know, wasn't and, 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 you know, it's not, you know, you, you need boat shoes. <laughs> but but as, the thing, as, it's a significant as, amount of shad, nonetheless. Yeah. So, so, so here we are. We're left with somebody called public sector pension investment. So every time uh, uh, somebody is reporting on this, please say Canadian owned, First Light Power, Delaware registered, and then say First Light. You know, and then you know, and then I love to see what Alicia Barton, who came out of like you know quasi state uh, state work over in New York State with NYSERDA. And here with the Massachusetts, um, uh, oh, there was some energy, Clean Energy Commission. And then they get bought up by these venture capital firms mm -hmm. for big bucks. And then you start reading stuff in the paper, and they make these grand statements like, Northfield Mountain has, uh, produces enough energy to power 1.3 million homes for a whole year. No, it doesn't. That, Oh my goodness, how can you say that? I just know that. You do know that because Northfield Mountain has never produced a single watt of virgin no, energy in its, in its entire time. But what they don't also tell you is um, in order to produce that 1.3 million you know, average home bunch of energy, they have um, already used up the electricity from the power grid from, from uh, what, uh, na uh, climate changing natural gas, some hydro, and uh, they, of 1.97 million homes, if you, wanna, if, you want, if you wanna sort of use that while producing the power. So, so you know, nearly two million homes, they never tell you but that they, they have not done it. they profit on the difference. Well, that's the thing, Drew, and he, you know, here's some interesting stuff. I did a little comparison, right? So, so Okay, if, if you want to make big statements, because because they can be from like the high twenties to fully one third, you know, energy loss in everything they do, right? So if 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 you look up in the U.S. Census Bureau, um, the number of housing units in specific counties, Suffolk County, Boston, Chelsea, Winthrop, Revere, two hundred forty five thousand housing units, right? Um, and the, the 1.3 million, that's, that's about 430,000 homes that they've already wasted a year's worth of electricity on. So you could power Boston's 
households. This is for single, single households or individual households. In Boston or Worcester County, 338,000. And then you might be able to add in Hampshire County with 59,000, uh, you know, average single households, and Franklin County. Mm -hmm. So you could either take Worcester, Hampshire, Franklin, or Suffolk, Hampshire, Franklin, and you could power those homes for a year with the climate wasting, not clean, not renewable energy that they want to use to pull the Connecticut River but they backwards say it is energy here after. efficient and it's clean and it's in, and because it's water and it's hydro. Drew, so. <laughs> Drew this is anti gravity <laughs> machine. I mean, let, let's it face sucks. it. I want uh, I want kids right. First light announced. Oh, this is probably a month and a half ago, too. First Light Power launches Valley Climate Champions Program, all right? And here, you know, they think uh, they have uh, Alicia Barton saying, oh, we, here we go. Franklin County, uh, poorest, one of the poorest counties or the poorest county in the state. Well, we're going to have school kids compete against themselves. And they get to win a thousand. The teachers that, that apply for this grant, they, they apply and they could get a thousand dollars for seven different schools and also Franklin County Tech. And then there's a two thousand dollar bonus, okay, for the, for the winning, for the winning entry. So that's about $10,000, Drew. And this company's been here for five or six years now, and they're like well, one to $200 million profit per year company who walked away from the Commonwealth walked out of Franklin County. I mean, they will end up paying some taxes here to, to some of these individual towns. But what a joke. Tell your kids to investigate what anti-gravity machines, how much energy are you able to expand? And, and, and they want to they wanna do this thing where they're, they're promising you you're going to get clean energy by taking wind turbines, you know, 150, 200 miles off the coast. And using that energy to come here, suck the Connecticut River backwards. And I know we've talked about this, but just indulge me one more time. And I know I'm running my mouth. Yes, keep going. And I, there are diagrams about, about a third to 40% of the year, you know, say, say three to four to sometimes more months. The Connecticut River natural routed flow, which means water entering the river, is only a, it's somewhere in the 4,000 and something above that range. When Northfield Mountain reverses its turbines using massive amounts of energy from the power grid, and it sucks up energy at 15,000 cubic feet per second, I can't remember how many, how many hundreds of mansions that is per second, 15,000 cubic feet, but that is a giant gulp right. of water for hours at a time. Right. There are diagrams from this relicensing studies. The Connecticut River is actually can be pulled back upstream Okay, living rivers don't flow upstream for three miles or more, okay, because it was only a five kilometer study. That's amazing. And if you look, three miles, one, you know, one to maybe two feet per second. So maybe they should, maybe the tubers and the rafters that want to come in and, and sort of power through Rock Dam and those ancient environments that nobody is taking care of. Maybe they should just go rafting upstream, okay? Just have Northfield uh, do their so, work. So, in, so the fact that this is so crazy and that we keep having the same conversation, yeah. and it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. It, it really reflects I, upon something that's been happening for years since we've had um, industries regulated, like by the EPA right. and, and whatnot. Yeah. That's the concept of industry capture. Yeah. Um, you have people that work in the industry who become lobbyists, who get hired by the government to take positions regulating the very industry that they were working for. And somehow they're always sympathetic to the profit motives of these industries and not necessarily to the actual outcomes or whether it's even meeting the regulations as they're written. So what is the recourse? Who do we talk to? Who's to blame? Well, yeah, the picture, what you're describing is essentially what it is. I mean, the, the river gets talked about in this, these relicensing as an algorithm. And that's all it was. But these are real people, that's though, right. that are yeah. doing this. But that, that, that's what it is. That's, what it, that's why they're here. That's why PSP Investments, First Light Power, Delaware is here, right? They're here because they, you know, they, they essentially, I, f I consider it hostile takeover, you know, in some ways. This is supposed to be the public's river. Northern Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, they're, the only thing they're proposing in, uh, up at Northfield Mountain, not any changes, they want to run Northfield Mountain even more. Uh, the only thing they're proposing is to put in a barrier net with three quarter inch mesh that the only thing that that will do, it'll keep 
downstream running adult shad and American eels, which, you know, sort of won't be captured in that net. Um, it'll keep them from running straight up into the turbines right away. But every, everything that Northfield Mountain sucks throughout the year is, is considered functionally extirpated. So what's, what, what will continue to happen is when fish get put up to Vermont, New Hampshire, northern Massachusetts, particularly shad, tens of millions of eggs can just go right through that mesh. Uh, a couple million, uh, a couple million juvenile shad. We don't, and there's 24 other species that have not right. been studied there. So, so the grimness of this is the fact that they stepped in and they saw federal and state agencies, and these agencies include National Marine Fisheries, you know, primary importance, short nose sturgeon. Not doing a thing. 15 years we've okay, known so about. Okay, so who? Who? How do we get in touch with people ah, and say, look, let this me, has to change? Let me see if I can sort of give you a little, a little something. Help me here. out here, Carl. All right. And, and, and there is, by the way, there, there, I, I know that there is a group of people that are sort of looking into different things. And, 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 and this interesting, uh, um, my turn, showed up in the Greenfield Recorder recently. And it was somebody from the Ocean River Institute that was basically offering help to the Connecticut River. And I, I did a little sluicing and they're, they're, in, they're in Cambridge, Mass. But they can see that th this ecosystem is not being protected, right? So that's pretty interesting. And then, I, you know, and you can look across, um, the Connecticut River Watershed Council has been in business since 1952. Mm -hmm. How many lawyers on staff? Zero. Right. How many staff people? 18. I look across the Hudson River, who fought their pump storage station in the mid 60s exactly the, the, exactly the same time right it was storm king mountain they were going to do it they were nobody they were they were a little hudson river fishermen's association and and Cena cuts it some little they fought for 15 years and they battled that storm king mountain pump storage proposal to the ground they killed it and in 1980 they became the hudson river keeper right. and now the Riverkeeper organization has 350 chapters across the globe. Okay. And how many employees do you think a, a big organization on a big river system that must have four or five more million people or, or times, times bigger than the Connecticut River Warship Capsule? How many, how, many, uh, how many employees do you think that they have over at Hudson Riverkeeper? 18. <laughs> 28? Oh, 28. Okay. 28. So that's ridiculously low for how much they do compared to... Well, here's the kicker, right? They lawyers. advertise, exactly. They have four, at least four lawyers on staff, and they say, we investigate and we go to court. So are, are you, can we ra rope them into helping us? Well, there, you know, we there is, it, people have to organize themselves. And they, you know, like I said, I've been hearing people are interested in, in, you know, why would you get a solicitation out of the blue? Because people understand that something needs to change here. And it's not going to be the organization that has been tied to Eversource, who built Northfield Mountain forever, um, and you know still have a, a board full of people that are mostly about money, mm -hmm. and you know, and a lot of the staff is just dedicated to money and grants. And then they are still part of the Connecticut River Atlantic Salmon Commission, right? As a matter of fact, Andrew Fisk is now the chair of the Connecticut River Atlantic Salmon Commission, but they. Oh, let me just do this, Drew. I just have to. You can't do that job very well if you're taking money from, say, the National Fish and Wildlife Federation, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources, the Connecticut Council on Soil Water Conservation, the Massachusetts DEP. You're never going to go to court against people who you're embedded with and have your hand in their pocket so it's a safe bureaucratic system for everybody. So that's, that's not why, safe for us, though. That's why, that's why you have solicitations from outside organizations. And that's why, you know, I, I know people that work for Riverkeeper. Um, there's, there, there are some real interesting characters that I've known for a while now there. And I just see, you know, and people, I think, see that we need a different organization here. Okay, and so, that's... Carl, I know that we're going to be coming to near the end of the show soon. Yeah. There was some information you wanted to share with our viewers. Ah. Yeah, um, I want to encourage people to go to FERC.gov uh, and you can do e-comment. Um, but one of, the, one of the biggest things, you know, as a journalist, I see that empowers people is to actually write to somebody like F the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, right? But you can go to my website and get a lot of information about what the problems are on the river. But then you turn around and what you should do is you also write 
the government agencies and the people who are responsible at the table for okay. keeping, keeping our river safe. And we are supposed to have, since the Supreme Court ruled, Holyoke Company versus Lyman, landmark legislation on the Connecticut River, upstream and downstream safe passage for fish on the Connecticut River. And that's clearly not being met. 1872, that is, that is landmark law. So here's a couple of people that I might start with. Um, just, just to sort of send your letter to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, keep it, keep it directly to the point, yep. and send it to the newspaper and also let them know that you might be CCing. And it, just here are some names. You can, I will send Drew these names and maybe he can run up the other thing. Yep. How about Sean McDermott, uh, Great Atlantic Region Fisheries Office, National Marine Fisheries Service. He'd be Sean McDermott at NOAA.gov. Uh, these, are, these are sturgeon people. Julie Crocker, Protected Resources Division, National Marine Fisheries Service. These are both in Gloucester. Julie, capital J, dot Crocker at NOAA.gov. So those are, those are people that are right here because we got nobody else doing anything. Um, here we go. We got, we got um, a river that's just sort of slumping into endangered species territory. So how about Mr. Timothy Timmerman? Uh, he's the EPA New England Region 1 Office of Environmental Review. He's Timmerman at Timothy at EPA.gov. Uh, let me see what else. Uh, let's get to Massachusetts. Mr. Brian Harrington, Bureau of Water Resources, Deputy Regional Director, Mass Department of Environmental Protection. He's Brian.D.Harrington at state.mass.us. David Cameron, Division of Wetlands and Waterways. That's important right here. David is also Mass Department of Environmental Protection. David Cameron at state.mass.us. Let so do these people have, actually have agency to make any kind of... Some of them do. Certainly the, the, certainly the, the federal people, of course, uh, you know, and Julie, Julie Crocker, I know, seen her at the table. And here's another one for Mass Division is um, Jesse Ledick. And I like Jess. Some of these people, you know, they would do their jobs if they were pushed to do it. Jess.Ledick at mass.gov. There's only a couple more folks. I just, you know, sometimes... Just having people recognized in public is really important. Um, there's Mr. Steve Maddox at the Mass Division of Fish and Wildlife, also responsible for shad and sturgeon. Steve Maddox, uh, Steve.Maddox at mass.gov. And let's do uh, Miss Eve Schluter, Assistant Director of Natural Heritage and Endangered Species, uh, Mass Division, uh, Eve.SC Schluter at mass.gov. And finally, Historic preservation, because there are some real serious uh, historic and cultural preservation issues uh, in our, our besieged section of the river. That would be Miss Brona Simon, brona.simon at mass.gov. So these are the people who we would like to see more of in public. So, would, and also in the FERC record, because the public record is what's going to matter, and that's where the pressure is, but the pressure is applied here. So, Drew. Carl, you have your blog. Uh, I have my blog, indeed, and it, it's, it's a do screed. These, do you have the, uh, if people go to your blog, can they find out who the people I will, I will make sure I get this stuff to you. I don't know. This, this, uh, this stuff I, I grabbed from a FERC document, so it's not particularly there, but I will make sure I get you these names and addresses I mean, I'll put it and, in our I, and and I will and I will um, I will work to get these somehow in our blog. They actually some of them do already exist in there to be honest with you. Um, my blog is not particularly exciting. It's full of information. It is but, full of information. But we've I also run out of time. I, so. I, <laughs> we are out of time. <laughs> Drew, can we have another couple of two or three of these? By the way, I'd, I'd like to invite uh, Peter, Peter Brandian, who's the VP of Operations. ISO New England is a big Anybody you want to have on, a you big talk supporter. to me, we'll make something we happen. Need to have, we need to have Gordon Van Wiley, President and CEO. ISO New England, they, have, they are killing our river for our children and grandchildren. They, they are the biggest supporter of Well, let's talk North about what we can Mountain do. First it, you know, more, because this is a half hour's up. Yeah. So, gentlemen, join us next time, please. Let's find a forum, Drew. We need to, and we need okay. to get the agencies out here. We need to get, we need to get. Well, if the Watershed Council wants to show up, let's. We'll, let's we'll work on getting something going. Yeah, okay. Let's do that. Carl, thanks Drew, once again, and, and a, I'll be seeing you soon because I, we're not done, folks. <laughs> it's a pleasure. We are done with today's episode. I've enjoyed this though, and I, you know, I, 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 I get bathed, I get buried in this stuff, and it gets really dreary. So, thank you for being sort of fun and a, and a fine host. I want to thank GCTV and you. Very well. Thank you for joining us. Take care. Yeah, right. Thanks.